Now, you may wonder, why are we talking about the teachings of Jesus here at CSL Dallas? Well, um, over 50% of, of our faith, our philosophy, our way of life comes from the teachings of Jesus. Go, Jesus! Go, Jesus. <laughs> we got one Jesus fan and freak in the house. Make it two. Do I hear three? Do I? That's good. All right, I see hands. So do you know you're part of our online community? Every time you watch us, you belong to CSL Dallas, and we're so happy that you're part of our community. And we love providing you this kind of spiritual message. So if you want to keep seeing this, please donate. You can donate at csldallas.org slash give, or you can text 972-954-4404. Be part of our community and sit back and enjoy the message. All month, um, we're talking about igniting the teachings of Jesus. And um, it's, it's a rich month. Uh, Dr. Peter and I started uh, um, on the Beatitudes, and we rewrote the Beatitudes for today's time. Make sure you get a copy of that. There's some still laying around. Uh, last week, um, I talked about, what did I talk about? Oh, faith and, and belief. Yes, faith and belief last week. Um, we're going to uh, talk about something else. And then next week, uh, Tracy Brown's going to talk about prayer. You know, Jesus uh, really taught us how to pray, and it's the type of prayer that we teach here. Um, affirmative prayer, science, mind, treatment, so you don't want to miss that either. So our book of the month, which uh, we are all using, and it is it, another book dropped off the top five list. This is now in my top five. Um, and the reason being is this is the most collective work of the teachings of Jesus that Ernest Holmes has written. Now, you may wonder, why are we talking about the teachings of Jesus here at CSL Dallas? Well... Um, over 50% of, of our faith, our philosophy, our way of life comes from the teachings of Jesus. Go, Jesus! Go, Jesus. <laughs> we got one Jesus fan and freak in the house. Make it two. Do I hear three? Do I? That's good. All right, I see hands. Wonderful. So he has something profound to share with us. Now, what's interesting is um, he has alternative wisdom to share with us. But in the beginning, his followers, early on, they were called the followers of the way. They were followers of the way. They weren't known as Christians. That came later. So imagine to follow the way. So maybe that's how you might want to take this up. Like, I'm going to be open to and curious to what is the way that he has to teach me now in my life if Ernest Holmes is bringing so much of his teachings to bear and our faith and what we teach here. So um, these followers of Jesus, imagine you're walking amongst him. And, you know, it starts off with a few, and then uh, not too many more. But, you know, there were people around, but there was, he, he brought this uh, way of teaching that was new. It was very new to the times. Um, he taught people how to put it into practice, into their lives. He was very clear about that, though. Not everybody got the clarity, and not everybody took it up. Um, perhaps the people uh, that were following him felt a little uncomfortable because they were in the minority, weren't they? They were not in the majority. So imagine that this, this guy, this teacher, this rabbi arrives on the scene and starts saying things that actually had not been said before. He sort of turns things on its head, right? And then people start following him and start practicing and listening, and it's quite the majority. And those people were ridiculed, those people were questioned. In today's times, one might say it was a cult. And, and does any of this sound familiar? 
So, so be open, because um, um, he has some alternative wisdom to share with us. Now, before he came along, um, stories were definitely used, and stories were used primarily to um, bring out uh, things that were moralistically and ethically um, grounded. And so these stories were used to bring rules to bear. Now Jesus, yes, he, 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 um, he told some stories, but when we use stories for moralistic and uh, for rules and for ethics, we can miss the transformative power of them. So he brought this thing um, onto the scene called parables, alternative wisdom. And anybody study the parables of Jesus before? Let me just see who's going to recognize some of the things I say. Okay, we've got some in the house. And these parables turned this worldly wisdom on its head. And sometimes they were confusing. And you have to spend a little time because they don't make sense intellectually. You, you can't get this intellectually. So let's just, can we just leave our brains parked beside us on a chair for a moment? Because we can't do this intellectually. We've got to engage with these parables. And, and when we do, our viewpoint could perhaps uh, be changed forever for our own life and for the lives of, of us around us. So... Um, um, Petra and I were talking about this, and she says, yeah, his parables and the way that you can get transformative wisdom out of them, you can actually grok something. I was like, what the heck is grok? <laughs> so it's like getting something that you couldn't get. You know, Oprah would call it aha moments, whatever, but you like grok something. So y'all look that up later. But, uh, you know, I, it was a new word for me. Um, but you can grok something because what Jesus brought was he talked about the spiritual life. He talked about the Father and I are one. He talked about our relationship with this Father, this Mother, this God, life itself. And he didn't stop there. He talked about our relationship with one another and how we are to move through this life from that perspective. So we're going to explore a few parables. Are you willing to go on this exploration with me this morning? Okay, good. Maybe you'll grok something. <laughs> All right, the first one we're going to talk about is the parable about the laborers in the vineyard. Okay? Um, there are, um, there's this vineyard, and there was this man that owned the vineyard, and he needed some laborers to go out into the field. Very early in the morning, he found a group of these laborers, and he said, I tell you what, I'll hire you for the day, and I'll give you a shilling. They were like so excited and said yes. So the day began, the laborers were in the field, they started to work. Along the day, as the day continued, there were other men standing around. And the vineyard owner said, hey, why are you standing around? Would you? He invited them to go into the field. And, and they said, okay. Now this happened at the third hour. This happened at the sixth hour. Some say it happened at the ninth hour. And it also happened at the eleventh hour of the day. Okay? People kept joining in as laborers in this vineyard. It's at the end of the day. It's at, you know, nightfall. And the owner of the vineyard gathers everyone together. And he says, okay, now I'm going to pay you, you know, for your work today. And he started with the 11th hour person. He started with the one who joined last. And he gave them a shilling. And then he kept going. He went to the people that joined in the ninth hour and gave them their pay. He gave the ones at the sixth hour, gave them the pay. The ones at the third hour gave them the pay. Now, the ones that started very early in the morning, they watched all this, and they were expecting more than what um, he had given them to all these other people. And when he gave them their same wage, a shilling, um, they weren't quite, they weren't very happy about it. They were murmuring and grumbling, and they basically were upset and said, how could you, how could you give them the same as us? We were out in the field much longer. 
much longer, and we're in the sun. And so what the, um, what the, the uh, answer was is he said, friend, I did you no wrong. Didn't you agree to do the work for a shilling? It is my will to give the one who showed up last just as I gave to you. So this is where this phrase, so the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Heard that before? Okay. So now we come into um, what Ernest Holmes says about this and what does this teach us and what can this teach us for the sake of our own life. So first of all, In the parable, Jesus is likening the vineyard to life, to life itself. So the vineyard is life, okay? The laborers represent our relationship to life itself. And God, Spirit, is the owner of the vineyard, okay? So those who were early in the experience uh, uh, come to understand that their relationship to God and how life works and those who discover the spiritual laws of the universe and how they work, it doesn't matter when we come to this moment in our life and when we discover it, we each get to reap the benefits of it equally. That's the great news. So it doesn't matter when you come into this. You reap the same reward. So, in other words, God will give to us as fast as we can receive. That's a good thing. There ain't no slow receivership. As fast as we can receive, we can receive. And, and if we think about it, there's no time in the spiritual realm. So in the human realm, we start putting time on this stuff. But in the spiritual realm, there is none. So it doesn't matter. There's no late, there's no early, it just is. The important questions to begin to ask is, do you have less because others possess as much good as you do? That's a question I want you to answer. No. So it doesn't matter how much good you possess. It takes nothing away from me, right? And secondly, is there enough to go around? There is, right? And the real question is, so therefore... I don't know about you, but I've done this a time or two in my life. Are we willing to stop comparing ourselves to others? You see, it's like, well, he got the promotion and I didn't. Or whatever, you know, can we stop that? It does not matter when we come into the vineyard, life itself and our relationship to it, we receive it. So the great lesson that this parable is, is he is wanting us to learn and to get, and I am, and Ernest Holmes is as well, is that the life delivers itself into our own individualized capacity to receive it. The outpouring, as Ernest Holmes will say, of the cosmic horn of plenty. Think of this cosmic horn of plenty that is just outpouring and wanting to outpour is always pouring. And whatever size container we have, if it's laid on its side, we're not getting it. We're not receiving it. So we've got to be open to receive that. And um, it isn't a question of deserving. Ernest Holmes also points out about this parable because um, everyone is already deserving. We don't have to do anything. It's not about our actions. It's not about what we do. The men in the parable do one thing. They accepted the invitation from life itself to go into the vineyard, didn't they? 
So when we choose to accept the invitation and to realize that we can receive, then we can. And so the owner of the vineyard, in the parable they say Lord of the vineyard, um, I, I choose not to use certain words, I don't want us to get tripped up. Uh, the owner of the vineyard stands for the givingness of spirit, and the vineyard is the fruits of life that we can receive as much as we believe that we can. And so um, this is truly a wonderful representation. He does this many, many, many times in his teachings of the law of cause and effect. One of the key things that we teach here. So, what I like about this parable is it actually is a lesson of hope and that whenever we choose to receive, we do. And we can let go of any thought that we have to do something, we have to earn something, we have to be something, we have to get anywhere. When we say we're ready to go into the vineyard, then we receive. Okay? Um, so it doesn't matter when you choose. It starts. Now, there are three more parables that I'm going to <laughs> sort of glom together. Okay? There are three parables um, that have to do with the law of circulation. Another important law that we talk about. The great teacher, Jesus, likened the kingdom of heaven to ten virgins who took their lamps and went forth to meet a bridegroom. Five of these virgins were wise and five of them were foolish. The foolish ones took their lamps, but they intentionally did not take the oil. They left it at home. So they took the lamps without the oil, and the wise ones brought the lamps and the oil with them. Okay? In the middle of the night, the bridegroom came, and basically um, they all arose and they trimmed their lamps right? They trim their lamps, and the foolish ones said to the wise ones, they said, quote, give us of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. Okay, that wasn't even the truth. So our lamps have gone out, and they're asking for oil. So that's one parable. In another parable, Jesus likened the kingdom of heaven to a man who gave a certain number of talents to each of his servants, after which the man departed. And he left for a while. And while he was gone, some of them multiplied their talents, and some of them hid their talents in the ground. They literally buried their talents in the ground. So when this man came back and returned, and he wanted to see how did the talents grow or not, and he started to do some accounting from his servants, there were some that had, that had increased the talents that he had loaned them, and, there were, and they were commended, and there were others that didn't at all because they had hidden them in the ground. And he basically said that was very unprofitable. <laughs> And then the third parable in the same vein is a parable that he talks about ten pieces of money, which he uses as a symbol of the divine gifts that God has imparted on us. And through using these gifts, we actually multiply them when we use them. Otherwise, if we don't use the gifts, they diminish. If Scott doesn't use the gifts of playing the talent of the piano, and he doesn't use them and keep using them, over time, wouldn't those talents diminish? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so we have these talents, and we have to use them. So even a little good that we have, if we don't use the gifts, they're going to wither. And so we can't hold on to them tightly in our hand. So, the wise virgin, virgin, virgins, the wise virgins were the ones who allowed their oil and their wicks to run deep, Jesus says, and they were connected to the oil of spirit. And the oil of love is always flowing, and it doesn't ever stop. 
but we have to be part of this flow of the in and the outgo of this love. If we receive without giving, there is congestion and there is stagnation. If we give without receiving, it stops the inertia and it causes exhaustion. Have you ever had times in your life where you just give and you give and you give and you give and you don't take time to receive for yourself? There's exhaustion. And then you don't feel like you want to give anymore. So Ernest Holmes sums all of this up as it relates to divine circulation with this. He says, just as there must be an intake, or there can be no outgo, so there must be an outgo, so there can, or there can be no intake. If we bury the talent, it remains static, inactive, unproductive. We must use or temporarily lose, and he notes, temporarily because there is no eternal loss. We lose the use of that which we refuse to multiply. That which we refuse to give cannot come back multiplied. Only when the divine circulation is permitted to flow in an uninterrupted stream can the giving and taking equalize. In the long run, he says... Everyone who loves is loved. All who give joy receive it back. Everything moves in circles. That's actually from Emerson. In cycles of cause and effect, more is added to the much we use. And when we refuse to use our gifts, they shrivel up. The divine flow is short-circuited. The one who gives for the joy of giving will receive back even more joy than he or she can give out. Ever as a volume increases, the circle will increase. There can be no point of saturation. There can be no point of saturation in that which is infinite. Oh, I invite you right now to just sort of reflect on a time. I just invite you to go within to your own self, in the space of your own self, and reflect. Has there been a time where perhaps there's not been this free-flowing givingness or receivingness of love, of joy, of wisdom that you had to give or to receive the wisdom through something or someone. How about financial abundance? That can be a sticky point for some of us. Has there ever been a time where it's been restricted either on the outflow and or the inflow? And can you pinpoint that time and what that was like for you. Now, in the same breath, take a breath. Has there been a time in your life where you just gave freely of one of those things? Just so freely. The love, the joy, the wisdom, the financial abundance, whatever it is, has there been a time where you gave so freely, so excitedly, and or received it back? Bring that into your awareness. Is there a difference? Come back out with us. Can you, can you sense a difference 
That's a true question. Yes. So especially around, I mean, we each have our hot buttons. It could be love. It could be of service. You know, we have five spiritual practices here, and two of them are like sacred service and sacred giving. Some of us come from a background and, and communities where it was constantly give money, give money, give money in a spiritual community or something similar. And it may cause us to restrict. Well, here there's one, well, there's two reasons. I'm being very transparent. There's two reasons why we teach sacred giving. Primarily, we want you to know the truth and the experience of the law of circulation. And until you work it and use it, you don't know how much it works and you can use in your life. And number two, we encourage it because when you give, you give to every single person in here. Some people have given so long ago that this place is still thriving so that we all can be here this morning. And so through these parables, whatever has like resonated, like if you grok something, just one little thing from these parables that, that Jesus talked about all the time, and you can put whatever it is into practice to know that when you accept the invitation and want to receive that there's the vineyard right there. If you want to work with the law of circulation, do that. But, uh, the laws are an active all the time, all the time. And so as we use them, we use them for the benefit of our lives and for the lives of every single person around us. And this week, I want you to practice what you grok so you can get more than you got. And so it is. And so um, I want to invite the practitioners and the ministers to come forward. And while they're coming forward, I want to ask the greeters to pass something out to you. Come on up, ministers and practitioners, please. Um, play just a little real quiet, Scott. So, I don't know about you, but lately, and you get to define how long lately is. Lately, I've been a little challenged by external conditions happening around me to stay centered. Is there anyone in this lately, whatever lately is to you, that has had the same challenge? I want you to look around to stay centered. Great. Oh. I've been blessed to be able to have some conversations with people in this community that have shared their challenge and we've had one-on-one -on -one conversations and because I got to have it with them, it helped me to stay centered because I remember the spiritual truths. And it just so happened that the Science of Mind archives sent something, a post out on social media and I saw it and I read this. And I thought, um, Scott, if you can, that's good. We're just going to talk. Yeah, sorry. I got I, I to gotta focus because I have to stay centered for the sake of myself and for you. When I saw this, I thought, oh, my goodness. I'm going to bring this into this community and see if we're willing. I'm going to suggest an experiment and see if we're willing to do this experiment. Greeters, I need all of the practitioners and ministers to also have this sheet of paper, please. I just realized that. So I'm going to read, and then the center paragraph 
I'm not going to read. I'm not going to read. Because I'm going to ask us to read it together as our prayer today. Okay? All right. Does anyone else need this paper? They're coming. So this um, is a suggested experiment by Ernest Holmes in April of 1942 during World War II. So there was some big stuff happening. And... Um, we weren't aligned with our spiritual truths at that moment so well, perhaps, in 1942. I don't know. I wasn't here. But I'm here now. So I'm a visual person, so you can uh, read along as I share the first and the third paragraph, and then I'm going to invite us to do the second together as our prayer today. During the trying times through which we are passing... It is but natural that we occasionally find ourselves caught in the meshes of mental depression. There are moments when we feel as though the whole world were holding its breath, tense with the expectation of evil tidings. Here is a wonderful opportunity for those of us who believe in spiritual power to try a simple but effective experiment. You may call this psychology, metaphysics, faith, prayer, new thought, or old thought. There is nothing in a name. The only thing that matters is, are we obtaining the desired results, and do we believe that there is a law of mind and spirit which can bring greater peace, joy, and comfort into our experience? If we do have this conviction, and if we have added to our spiritual faith the knowledge that there is a scientific principle of mind which may be consciously applied for any human need, then we are ready to make the experiment. I suppose each must do this in his, his or her own way, since no two persons are alike. I can merely suggest to you a way which has been effective in my own life during these last few months. I have been making it a habit to spend a few moments every day making the following declarations, which we'll do in a second. It is not necess all necessary that everyone should use these identical words, but I do believe that we should all cover these principal thoughts which seek to rob us as a sense of happiness and security, and particularly those thoughts that would discourage us and keep us from believing that the victory of truth must always rest on the side of right. If fear is contagious, faith is even more so, because it is more natural to have faith than it is to be afraid. We can never believe that a negative viewpoint has the same power as a positive one or that evil is equal to good any more than we can believe that darkness can obliterate light. It is the light that destroys the darkness, and we must see to it that our consciousness is filled with light. Fear is a habit of thought and creates a subconscious mental pattern which represents itself with monotonous regularity until the light of truth displaces fear with faith. Faith, on the other hand, rightly cultivated, will repeat itself with buoyant regularity. Both fear and faith are habits of thought and can be cultivated. So I am inviting us to take up this experiment, to be willing, like Ernest Holmes said in 1942, to say this every day until whatever you are holding so strongly in your heart about the human conditions that you may believe or feel are not aligned with the spiritual truths of the universe, to have faith that when we collectively do this experiment together, whatever you're holding in your heart will right itself in the truth because light dissipates darkness, okay? So this allows you the freedom to take up what you want in your heart. Are you willing to say this with me collectively? Those who want to, 
Okay, so this is our prayer today. So let's um, begin. I am filled with inexhaustible energy of life. I am filled with limitless enthusiasm for living. For there is a deep calm at the center of my being, which is undisturbed, which is forever at peace with the universe around me. I know that the power of good will prevail and that there is being worked out now in the minds of men and women everywhere a divine pattern of freedom, protection, and cooperation for all people. I know that no thoughts of doubt or depression can enter my consciousness. There is nothing in me that receives them. I live in the buoyancy of spirit. There are no doubts in my consciousness. I have an ever-deepening appreciation for all people, an ever sense of gratitude for the knowledge that the spirit cannot be assailed. I know that good is finally going to come to everyone and that all problems will be solved. Neither fear nor self-pity can operate through me. I am alive with life, with joy, and continuously upheld by a deep, unshakable conviction that there is a power, presence and a power, and an intelligence in the universe which is working out a perfect pattern for human conduct and relationships. I rest in peace, in joy, and in love. I know that this is not only true of myself, it is true of every person who lives. Ashe, Aho, I mean, and so it is.